Credit cards are everywhere, so much so that it's hard to imagine the modern world without them. We've built an economy that's 70% reliant upon consumer spending, and it's helped us fund our modern lifestyles. But credit cards are far from a modern idea. Starting in the late 1800s, credit was a privilege based around trust and personal relationships. A business would give select customers personalized coins or metal plates that allowed them to buy on credit. And as popularity increased in the 1920s, these coins and metal plates evolved into paper cards. As the number of stores offering credit increased, the act of carrying around many different cards became awkward and inconvenient. Then, in 1950, the Diners Club arrived. It allowed card-carrying members to shop and dine at multiple places, all on credit, all on the same card. Middlemen like club cards and local banks were making credit more available. Those direct relationships that defined early credit began to fade. In 1958, Bank of America introduced a card that shaped the future of credit. Before this, people had to settle their balances at the end of each month. Paying it off each month helped them limit their spending. But Bank of America's card didn't require them to pay it off every month. And they loved it. They could live beyond what their paychecks allowed. Why wouldn't they love it? Bank of America then set out to make their card a household necessity. To do this, Bank of America needed to expand. They franchised their card with a network of banks across the U.S. Eventually, this network became independent from Bank of America and formed Visa in 1976. With a growing reach, credit card companies only had two problems left holding them back. Problem one, interest rates weren't standardized. Every state had their own limits on interest rates at the time. But in 1978, the Marquette decision changed the game entirely. The Marquette decision was a pivotal moment for the banking world. It allowed banks to issue credit cards all across the country at consistent interest rates. The laws that determined those rates were built by the state where the bank was headquartered. Banks then started relocating to states where interest rates weren't capped. This is why so many ended up in South Dakota and Delaware. Problem two, credit cards weren't that profitable. Then came the recession of the early 80s and problem two was solved. Bank savings rates fell. Interest rates on debt didn't, making credit cards a bank's most profitable product. With nothing really holding credit cards back anymore, they exploded. The average amount of credit card debt skyrocketed from $2,000 a person in 1984 to $8,000 in 2008. That's a 400% increase. Today, about 80% of U.S. households carry multiple cards. That's more than 200 million Americans. And these consumers are trying to pay off a whopping $880 billion in total credit card debt. As credit cards shifted from an exclusive convenience to a routine practice, they lost the trust and personal relationships they were built upon. It doesn't feel like a privilege. Modern credit is a fluid part of everyday life. And credit continues to evolve to fit the modern lifestyle. How will our relationships to credit change? Will convenience lead us to feel detached from our spending? Or will the digital revolution bring an empowering tool to the industry?